Thank you, Mark and Mary. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17. Matthew 17. You know, our theme this year has been, it's all about the one. 2021 is all about the one, the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, in a special way, we've been going through our summer series on the defining moments in the life of Christ, just picking out those really exceptional moments. There's, I mean, you can't mention any moment in the Lord's life that's not an important moment. The Lord has uh, recorded those for us. I was thinking the other day, what, what would you say if somebody said, I can give you a time machine, you can go back and see any event in the Lord's life, uh, which one would you like to see? And I thought, boy, you, you couldn't lose. Any, uh, any one you picked out would be absolutely life transforming. But we're going to talk about one this morning I think that is, is of particular interest and, uh, and boy, it wrestled with this one uh, in my study this week, but I, I want to tell you, God really has something I think special for our hearts in this uh, event that we find in Matthew chapter 17. Uh, let me first of all start by saying this. Uh, most teachers uh, of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ will break his life down into three-year periods. As three years of his earthly ministry, there's the year of his, um, of his obscurity, the year of his popularity, and then the year of opposition uh, that he uh, experienced. He stepped out of the waters of the Jordan River at his baptism from obscurity. And uh, he was a little-known but intriguing itinerant rabbi. And he gathered 12 disciples to himself, and he began to go from town to town preaching and performing miracles. And as his fame grew, so grew the crowds. And most of them, of course, were coming for the show. And then, as his popularity grew, the religious establishment began to view his teaching as a threat and so the opposition to him became more hostile and uh, more intense in the final year. At the beginning of his ministry, and uh, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, last message that uh, we brought out of this series before I went on vacation, uh, but a couple of weeks ago we looked at the fact that the devil took Jesus aside and to a high mountain apart and showed to him from that mountain peak all the kingdoms of the world, there to try to entice him uh, to uh, gain the crown without the sacrifice. If you'll just bow down and worship me, uh, I won't resist you. There won't be any of this uh, back and forth. I'll just, I'll just submit these things to you. All you have to do is bow down and worship me, which, of course, Jesus did not do. You know, he realized and he knew in his heart that it would involve the pain of the cross uh, for him to fulfill the Father's will. And then at the final, at the, at, the, uh, at the final event of his life, he climbs another mountain, Mount Calvary, where he will lay down his life for our sins. Now, right in between those two peaks, Almost in the center of those two peaks, we have Jesus ascending another mountain, a mountain of transfiguration. We will look at it this morning. And it is, again, approximately the midpoint of his ministry. And it could really be appropriately identified as a watershed moment, a point at which the initial excitement over his unique approach and his preaching begins to wane and the hostility begins to increase. But he's doing something very special in this moment for his disciples and for us that would follow. It's a truly spectacular incident in the life of the Lord, but to fully understand this, this situation, uh, we have to know what preceded it. Now, Listen real careful, this is kind of hard to get a hold of. But the events of Matthew 17 come right after the events of Matthew 16. Whoa. I went to Bible college to learn that. Um, okay. But what happened 
what happened at this time? What was going on? Well, if we go back, even go back as far as chapter 15, we saw that we see that Jesus had a, a second miraculous feeding of the multitudes with a few fish and few loaves. And then as a result of that, of course, the crowds were there, but they had come because of the meal, because of the miracles, because of the show, if you will. And Jesus in chapter 16 begins to deal and, and deal with his disciples and share with them some truth now that uh, they're not really ready to, to get a hold of. He asked them in chapter 16, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And through a miraculous revelation of God, because that's what Jesus said it came from, Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God and declared the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus takes that moment, and he begins almost immediately to begin to teach them that I must go to Jerusalem, and there I am going to be crucified. There I am going to die. And that's tough. The disciples, man, they, they're not sure they can handle this. In fact, Peter, right after this great statement that thou art the Son of God, he begins to say, far be it from you, Lord. And Jesus has to rebuke him and say, get thee behind me, Satan. You know, from one moment, God is using Peter's mouth to speak a great, wonderful truth. The next moment, the devil has got a hold of his tongue and using him. And so they, they, are, they are beginning to understand. They're beginning to to get this idea that Christ is king, but they're not yet understanding that he has to first suffer and then enter into his glory. And so Jesus is telling them that I'm going to die, but then he goes on in chapter 16 and tells them that the cost of your following me, your discipleship, is that you're going to have to take up your cross and follow me. That following me is going to cost you as well. A, a, a surrender of your own agenda and following me. And so at the very end of chapter 16, if you'll just drop back for a moment, you've got it open to chapter 17, but just go back to the last two verses of chapter 16, and you'll see that Jesus kind of concludes with a prophecy and a promise. This is the first time that Jesus now tells his disciples, I'm going away, but I am going to come back. This is the first time that from his own lips he tells them that he is returning. So we see in verse 27, it says, For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. And he gives them a promise, something that is going to kind of seal the deal. They'll know that he's speaking the truth. He know, they'll know that what he's saying will come to pass. In verse 28, he says, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So we see that Jesus said, I am going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, but I am going to come back again. And just so you know that I am telling you something that is going to happen, there are some of you that are going to get a little preview of this. That's what he's speaking of here. And, and it won't happen immediately. It's, it's six days later. Six days later, and that's where we open up here in 17. And the little word that begins this chapter is the little word, and. It shows us there's a connection between chapter 16 and chapter 17. And, and so he is going to give them a glimpse of the coming kingdom, what his glory will be. There will come suffering, but understand, there will be a glory also. So first, as we look at this, let's observe, first of all, the heavenly vision, verses 1 and 2. And after six days... Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment as white as the light. Now here's the moment. Here's the moment that they're in, and understand the significance of this moment. Suffering is coming. Jesus has told them that. 
And they needed to be able to endure this time. They needed to have the strength and the endurance to get through it. And so the Lord is going to do something for them that is very rare in the New Testament. He, in fact, uh, it, it is, this is not the only time, there's one other time, but he moves their faith to sight and lets them see his glory. The other time that he did this was with Thomas, who Thomas, who said, I will not believe unless I put my fingers into the prints, the uh, nails in his hands and thrust my hand into his side. And Jesus presented that physical evidence for Thomas. And when Thomas fell at his feet and said, my Lord and my God, he said, blessed are thou Thomas because you believe, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. But he's going to take these three and he's going to give them a actual glimpse of the glory to come. Now, if you look at a list of miracles, this is an amazing thing, because I've got different books on the life of Christ and different aspects of the life of Christ, and I've got books on the miracles of Christ. You look at a book of miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ or a list, you probably won't find this event on the list. And yet it is the greatest miracle that Jesus ever demonstrated while he was on the earth. In fact, one, one commentator said this, and I, th I think he's absolutely right. He said, the miracle is not that Jesus' glory was revealed on the Mount of Transfiguration, but that for 33 and a half years, that most of that time, he restrained that glory and held that glory in. The Lord didn't want the disciples to ever doubt the reality of the second coming. So he's giving them a little preview of its glory. Now, they're going to be encouraged through this because they will understand and know that humiliation meant ultimate glory. And that's what it means for us too. Romans chapter 8 verse 17 says, If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified with him. The disciples' hearts are filled with the assurance and hope in the midst of great despair. When Jesus tells them that he's going to have to die, this is, uh, this is a grievous thing. But now they're going to see that this is necessary for the glory to be manifested. So we see the moment there in, this, in the significance of that. We see the men that Jesus takes with him. Now Jesus has 12 disciples, right? Last time I read my New Testament, he had 12 disciples. And uh, why did he choose only three to share this remarkable moment with. Why not take the whole group up the mountain? Why not take everybody? In fact, this is such a wonderful miracle. Why not just do it in the middle of Jerusalem uh, during the Passover? Everybody could see it then. But do you understand that some of the most miraculous things that Jesus accomplished had fewer witnesses to it? The birth of the Lord Jesus Christ was not attended by great crowds, but by a little band of shepherds. Amen? And, uh, and we see over and over in the Lord's life that when he does things, he pulls this group apart. He's, he doesn't do these things as PR stunts. He's not doing it for public relations. He's doing it for a particular purpose. These men are going to have a special role. Now, God does... It, Romans 2.11 says that God is no respecter of persons. Amen? God, God doesn't have favorites. God doesn't have favorites. God doesn't love the preacher more than He loves you. The ground is level around the cross. Amen? No big eyes, little U's. But Vance Haver said this very wisely. Love Vance Havner, but he said, God does not have favorites, but he does have intimates. He does not have favorites, but he has intimates. He has those who will allow themselves to be drawn closer, who will draw nearer to him so that he can reveal more to them. He may not love one of his children any more than any of his, of his other children. But there are those who are closer to him and will see more of his glory and more of his power than those who stay 
farther away. And you say, well, that doesn't sound fair, but let me just say this to you. Another one of my favorite authors, A.W. Tozer, said this, and it convicts me every time I, I repeat it. But you're as close to God as you want to be. Oh, man, that pierces my heart. I, I, want, I want to argue with that statement and say, no, no, I really want to be closer. No, you're as close to God as you want to be. You let other things get in the way. You put other things in the way, and you're as close to God as you want to be. We can experience as much of His glory and His power as we desire to experience. You know, have you ever wondered why some people seem so full of love for the Lord, always ready to worship and praise Him? Do you ever wonder what their secret is? Well, it's really no secret at all. It's no secret at all. They've made up their minds to live as close to Him as they possibly can. As a result, He's promised to live close to them. James put it this way in James chapter 4, verse 8, Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. These men, these three men in particular, are going to have very significant roles to fill in the early church. They are going to have greater responsibility in many ways than some of the others. We have Peter, who is the faithful messenger, and he's going to declare the gospel and explain the manifestation of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And then, then in Acts chapter 10, he's going to open up the door of preaching to the Gentiles when he shares the gospel with Cornelius and goes into his home and shares the gospel with him there. Then there's James. James will be the first martyr. He'll be the pastor of the church at Jerusalem, and he won't write any of the books of the Bible because his life's going to be cut short so quickly. But he will become the first martyr of the church. And, and his life will be given because of his faithfulness to Christ. And then, of course, there's John, the futuristic mystic, or maybe we could say favored mystic in this way. He would be given the culminating message of the New Testament, the end of the age. He was going to be able to see all these things come to pass. All of these men are going to have a very significant role to play in the early church. And Jesus is giving them something to encourage their heart. To, to be able to, to give that message with full boldness and confidence. So we see the moment, we see the men, and then, of course, our focus needs to be on the Master. And He is here praying, and that's a detail that uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record this event, and Luke is the one that tells us that He took the disciples up to pray. And as He was praying, these things began to happen. So He's in the midst of prayer with the Father, and he begins to transform. And it's a transformation, first of all, that revealed his true person. It reveals his true person. When he came into this world, he used a veil of flesh and humanity to cloak his divine nature. The body is a wall that veils the inner nature. One day that's going to be stripped away. And when Christ allowed that to be pulled back somewhat there on the Mount of Transfiguration, that glory of God became visible. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all very brief, concise in their description. They don't say a whole lot about it. It's a moment of holy awe in their lives. And, and hard to share and hard to express. You ever had a moment like that with the Lord where you've been so close to the Lord? It's, just, it, it's such a holy moment. Sometimes you can't really know how to share it with anybody else. But they give a very brief very succinct description. His face did shine as the sun. His raiment was as white as light. But I wonder if we don't get a little better glimpse of what this was like when John describes the glorified Christ that he sees on the Isle of Patmos. You see, when John sees him on the Isle of Patmos, he is in his glorified form. And that's what they got a glimpse of here on the Mount of Transfiguration. What did John say about that? Revelation chapter 1, verse 14 says, His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like unto fine brass as they burned in a furnace. And the, his voice as the sound of many waters. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. 
Wow. This was the glorified Son of God. And they got a glimpse of that on top of this mountain. It revealed his true person. It reflected his tremendous purity in his life. The white garments in Scripture are symbolic of purity. We hear of the bride of Christ, in the book of, again in the book of Revelation, who is arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is at the righteousness of the saints. The robe of Christ was as white as the light. His purity is unequaled. There is no fault in him. Not the slightest hint of a stain of sin in his life. And it was reflected there on that mount. And then it relates his transforming power. He was transfigured. And the word there that Matthew uses, and Mark and Luke, is metamorphos. Which is where we, of course, get metamorphosis from. What is metamorphosis? It's a change that comes from inside. Most often we think about the illustration of a caterpillar who wraps itself in a cocoon and it goes through a process of metamorphosis. That, that ugly, wiggly, woolly little caterpillar splits that cocoon and comes out a beautiful butterfly. Now you can take wings and make them out of colored construction paper and pin them to the caterpillar and you kill the caterpillar. The real change has to come from within, right? And so what happened with Jesus was this, this glory that was within was coming to the surface and radiating out like a supernatural light bulb, so to speak. You know, and here's the interesting thing. That term, metamorpho, is used in connection with us as believers in our life. Just as Christ was able to allow his glory to radiate from the inside out, we as believers are to be transfigured in our life. It says in Romans 12 too, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed, metamorpho, transfigured. Be ye from the inside out changed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And then Paul said to the Corinthians over in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. This is a great verse. But we, I don't know why I always say this. this is a great verse, you know. They're all great. But, all right, this is a wonderful verse. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed, are metamorphosed, are transfigured into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. As we are looking into the Word of God and we see the Son of God and we reflect on Him and we meditate on Him, we are changed from glory to glory. We are changed on the inside and it begins to radiate out of our life. That's God's will for our life. That's His desire is that we be changed. Not conformed to this world, not pressed in it to its mold, but transformed from the inside out. That we might be conformed to the image of God's dear Son. We have to be changed that way from the inside out. If, if we change from the outside, that's not metamorphosis, that's masquerade. It's not a metamorphosis, it's a masquerade. And there's a lot of people who masquerade. I... I don't know if I have time to tell you this, but I, I was thinking about this. I, I'll be a little geek. I'll speak a little geek here for you. This, if you uh, were a child growing up in the probably in the 90s, maybe the late 80s, or you had children that were growing up in that time, uh, you were acquainted with little uh, figures, toys called transformers. Okay. And, uh, and now they've made movies about them, so you don't have to be that old to even know that. But uh, they had these cartoons and the Transformers. They were these alien beings, and they transformed. And most of the time, they looked like a normal, ordinary vehicle, a truck, a car, something of that nature. And then they would go through this process, and they would change. And they were here to help humanity, the Transformers were. But there was another group 
called the Decepticons. Ooh. They were not good. They were evil, right? But they could transform. They looked like ordinary vehicles too, but then they changed. But their intent was different. And you know, there are people being transformed, but there are also Decepticons in the house of God. There are those, the, the tares among the wheat that Jesus speaks about that grow up in the house of God. And sometimes you can't tell the difference by just looking on the outside. That's why Jesus said, let them grow together. Wait till the harvest. He said, you know, you could do some damage going in there with your sword and trying to chop out all the, all the weeds. You may get some of the wheat at the same time. So wait till I make the, uh, the purging at my coming. But there are those who are masquerading. They are not metamorphous. They're not changed, but they're only masquerading. So this heavenly vision then is accompanied by some heavenly visitors. We see in verse number three, and behold, while all this is happening, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah, or Elias, talking with him, then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If thou will, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And you know, we ask the question, why Peter, James, and John? What, we might ask, why Moses and Elijah? Why not Abraham and David, or Joseph and Daniel? I'm sure a lot of the Old Testament uh, personalities would have loved to have been there on top of that mountain with Jesus at that moment, and, and having conversation with him. But there was a specific reason. There was a confirmation of the Scriptures by the appearance of these two Old Testament notables. When you said Moses and Elijah, you were saying to a Jew, you were saying the Old Testament and the prophets. And many times when they referred to the Old Testament, they would call it Moses and the prophets or the law and the prophets. Moses and Elijah's appearance on that mountain was a confirmation that Jesus was fulfilling the scriptures and the prophecy of the Old Testament that God had set in, into uh, uh, motion way back in the book of Genesis. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17, that he came to fulfill the law and the prophets, and the presence of Moses and Elijah confirmed that fact that he did. Now, while they're there, what are they doing? Well, Luke gives us another added detail in Luke chapter 9, verses 30 and 31. It says, Behold, there talked with him, two men, which were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. That's a very important thing. The, the term that Luke uses here for talk indicates a prolonged conversation. A prolonged conversation. They were in deep conversation together for a period of time. And uh, what a Bible conference that would have been to listen in on, wouldn't it? To hear Jesus and Moses and Elijah discussing the Scriptures. And Luke uses two interesting words when he talks about this conversation. First of all, he says that they were talking about the decease. And literally, that word in Greek is the word exodus. It's the word exodus, which Moses, of course, would have understood very well, right? It meant a departing from. He was going to be departing, but Moses would also realize it wasn't just a departing from, it was a deliverance. The exodus was a deliverance. Amen? He said, they started talking about this exodus, this deliverance that Jesus was going to accomplish, and Moses is going to say, okay, now I see all of these things and how you used all of this to, to uh, be even an illustration of a greater truth. The decease or the exodus that he would accomplish. That's an interesting word. Accomplish. You know, when you talk about an accomplishment, you're talking about something that you do, that you planned to do. Something that it was an achievement. Amen? Amen? And it reminds us that this is a plan that's being brought to completion, not a series of events left to chance. 
Things just didn't happen. God had these things planned. And so here they are discussing this in a prolonged conversation together. <laughs> and about this time, we see the confusion of the saint. About this time, the disciples begin to wake up because Luke tells us that when they went up there, they fell asleep. There are some of their descendants here this morning. <laughs> they fell asleep, and when they wake up, here's Jesus in this transfigured body speaking to these Old Testament celebrities. And Peter, oh my, good old Peter, both Mark and Luke says, not knowing what to say, said. You ever known somebody like that? I don't, I, and got to say something, right? This can't go without comment. You know, just barely a week before this, he's called out by Jesus for letting the devil use his mouth. And so now here he is blurting out again. You know, and understandably, let's, let's cut him a little bit of slack. He's overwhelmed by awe in the presence of a glorified Lord and two Old Testament celebrities. And he's probably still a little groggy from waking up after falling asleep during a prayer meeting. You know, if you call me, you can call me anytime, folks. I guarantee you, I promise you that. But if you call me at 2 o'clock in the morning, give me about five minutes to get a coherent answer out of me, Okay. Now, I may not answer you coherently, so he's maybe just a little bit groggy at this time. But why have to say anything at all? Here's the problem. There are many times when the appropriate response to the presence of God is simply silence. Be still. Be still. And know that I am God. Be still in the presence of God. You know, when God is doing something and moving, we always feel like we have to add something, but maybe sometimes we just need to be still and soak it up and see what God is doing. And I don't know what Peter's motivation was at that moment. You know, he says, let's build three tabernacles. This is lean-to type thing. What he's referring to are are kind of like these lean-tos made out of uh, branches and what have you. He says, let's build these three tabernacles up here. Maybe the, maybe the point is, let's build it so we can just hang out here. Jesus, this is so good. Let's just stay here. Let's just stay in this moment. Or maybe it's to build a shrine to this moment. To build a shrine up here on this mountain. And you know, we want to do that a lot of times when God does something special. We'd like to live in that moment for, you know, forever, on and on. We get frozen in that place. You know, God's working here. Let's not do anything. Let's not do anything different. Let's just keep doing it. You know, but that's how God's working in this moment. We can't just freeze in that moment, right? Or we build a shrine to it. <laughs> Well, back in the good old days, <clears throat> you know, this is what, and we look back and nobody's ever done it quite like that anymore, you know, and we've built these shrines to these things. Good old days is a combination of a good imagination and a bad memory most of the time. But truly it was, it was a good moment. It was a great time to be there but it wasn't God's purpose. And, and the big flaw in Peter's plan is this, and it's huge. The big flaw is his suggestion put Moses and Elijah on the same level as Jesus. And Peter had just said not a week ago that Jesus was the son of the living God. You can't put Jesus in that same category. And so... Peter is not even finished with his thought. He's still, his motor is still running. And it goes on to say, we hear a heavenly voice. While he yet spake, 
Peter's interrupting Jesus and Moses and Elijah, and God, the Father, interrupts Peter. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. A bright cloud, an illuminated cloud, the Shekinah glory of God appeared. You think it's awesome, and and it was. It was awesome to be in the presence of the transfigured Son of God who is now shining. A shining cloud comes down. The Shekinah glory of God comes down. And these guys can't stay on their feet. They're on their face. He interrupts Peter with a word of exaltation. The Father says, This is my Son. Peter, you're wanting to honor Moses and Elijah. I want you to know, this is my beloved Son. He is the one and only. He is not a prominent figure in Bible history. He is the preeminent creator of the world and the Lord of the church. You know... I used to get upset. I'd go sometimes it'd be at the grocery store or someplace and I'd see these periodicals that they sell, you know, up by the by the cash register and stuff. And and every now and then you'll see one. It's uh, greatest figures in history, and, and it's a whole magazine that tells you all these great people that have lived in history. And and I always pick them up out of curiosity, because I want to see where they put Jesus in there. You know, and I want I want to find out where he comes on the list. And and generally speaking, I don't think I've ever found one that puts him at the top of the list. He's usually in the top ten, you know. I'll do him a favor, put him in the top ten or so. And that would make me so upset. And then I realized one day he doesn't even belong in the book. He doesn't even belong in a list of outstanding figures of history because there's no one else that can even compete with him. He is not prominent. He's not the top of the list. He is in a category all by himself. He is totally separate, totally other, the holy son of God, preeminent. Nobody can compete. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus has just told them he's going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to reject him. He's going to die. The Jews would reject him. Rome would execute him. But you know what? The father was pleased with him. And you know, in our lives, people may not always understand us. And they may reject us. And they may persecute us. But if God's pleased with us, that's all that matters. Amen? That's all that matters. There's a word of exaltation. This is my beloved Son. And there's a word of exhortation. Hear ye Him. Listen to Him. Yes. Listen to godly preachers. Read inspirational authors. But be sure that you're always listening for His voice. Listen to what He is saying to you. Amen? The Bible gives us a word of caution. It says, take heed. Be careful. Take heed that you hear. Take heed what you hear, and take heed how you hear. Take heed that you hear. We need to spend time listening to God's Word. We need to be where God's Word is being preached. Amen? But also be, take heed, be careful about what you hear. Because not everybody that's standing up and saying, Thus saith the Lord, is speaking for God. Be a Berean. Search the Scripture. See whether or not those things are so. Be sure that what you're hearing is from the Word of God. Take heed that you hear. 
Take heed how, of what you hear and take heed how you hear. How are you listening? Are you listening to be entertained? Are you going to go out and say, well, you know, that was an entertaining message. Or are you listening so that you can be changed by it, by you can do something with it so that it can work in your life? You know, I know sometimes, I raised three children, I know that many times they heard the sound waves were bouncing off the eardrums. But they were not listening with the intention of obeying. Amen? When you hear the word of God, be sure that you're listening with the intention to be obedient to the word of God. Then here's the two last verses here we'll consider, verses 7 and 8. Jesus came. They're on their face now. Jesus walks over and he touches them. And he says, arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. This is my son. Hear him. What is he going to say? First thing they're going to hear him say after the father tells him that is, get up. And you're down there, get up. He's going to lift us up. Amen. Let, let the Son of God lift you up. If you listen, listen to the voice of God, he'll lift you up. We don't have to be down all the time. Down in the valley. Just sharing with my good friend back there, Brian, talking about having rough days. I just heard a song this week. I really liked it. It says, I'm, I'm not in the valley. I'm just changing mountains. <laughs> And you know, we do get down, don't we? We do get down. And there will be some down times for these disciples. But listen, Jesus will lift you up. If you be risen with Christ, seek those things that are above. And be not afraid. Cast your care upon Him because He cares for you. Amen? They looked around and they saw no man save or but Jesus only. And that's pretty much a good summation of our walk with the Lord. It's about Him. If you're going to come for salvation, it is Jesus only that can give you eternal life. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation is not in our works. It's not in some man who is able to forgive your sin, it's in Jesus Christ and His finished work on the cross. Your sanctification, your living for God is in Jesus only. It's not in how hard you do it, but it's Jesus living His life through you. Jesus only. It's the one we live for His approval. Jesus only. You know, I, I love to come in here and have a favorable response to the message. I'd be lying if I said I didn't. I want a favorable response. But really, he's the audience. Jesus only. What does he think about what my life, what direction my life is taking? Look to Jesus only. Let's stand together with our heads bowed.